five dead in Burby smash up after car slams into lorry. Labor chops driver to death, father mutilated during row over damaged banana suckers. Seven homeless as fire guts house in Diamond, and minimum wage to be $60,000. Those were the top headlines for the week ending October 20. I'm Ashley Scotland. Good afternoon. Starting things off on MTV News Update's Week in Review, we tell you that a driver has been brutally chopped to death while his father is hospitalized from multiple chop wounds. The chopping spree is alleged to have stemmed from a row over a banana farm. The suspect, a laborer, is in police custody for the beastly act. Nikhil John who followed this report. A 31-year-old driver was brutally chopped to death while his father was also chopped about his body and is admitted in the hospital. The victim has been identified as Harinarine Ramawaj of Cane Grove, East Coast, Demerara. According to information, the deceased and his father left for their cash crop farm on Sunday, October 15, located at Cane Grove. They have been farming there for 40 years. Upon arrival, they saw a wooden structure on their farm while some of the banana suckers were destroyed, the father and son proceeded to the wooden structure and confronted the man. Inside, an, an argument subsequently ensued. During the heated argument, the suspect, who is a laborer in the Cane Grove area, dealt the father and son several chops about their bodies. Police say the father and son were rushed to the Woodlands Hospital, where 31-year-old Harinarine Ramawaj was pronounced dead on arrival. The man's father, 59-year-old Chanderpaul Ramawaj, who is in a serious condition, was admitted at the Woodlands Hospital. The suspect, a 43-year-old laborer, was also injured during the confrontation and was treated at the Maikoni Cottage Hospital. He was subsequently sent away and is in police custody assisting with the investigation. Nikhil Jondo reporting for MTV News Update. Following the demolition to a number of homes that were on government reserves in Sofia, residents of that area staged a protest at the Central Housing and Planning Authority, condemning the actions taken. However, the Chief Executive Officer of the CHNPA committed to help squatters who have no legal land to begin the process. Yanis Abrams has more. Less than a week after the Central Housing and Planning Authority began demolishing shacks that were on government reserves in Sofia, Residents picketed in front of the government building on Brickdam. Speaking with the squatter, some alleged that they did not receive any letter from the CHMPA requesting them to vacate the area. This is despite the authority erected signs at various points in Sofia indicating that squatting is illegal. Some persons also said that they have written to the government agency to receive land. The government didn't get nobody no notice or not. Them just come breaking down and break down my shop without saying queer. When we go outside, it's like you can't even send on because them like they're supposed to give you a notice when you're breaking down. And f the business helps you out a lot. They want to put you off of the place where we going to go. Where me mature going to go. Last week, so I mean, this was by my home. He told me if I never go to by myself, so pack up and move on, go where I come from. I told him I have nowhere to go if you know where I came from. He said he don't business, he didn't put me there. And if I never go to myself, I must pack up my things and come and come out to the place before he come and break me down. Leader of South Lillianda Progressive Development Group Community, James Hermanstein, told me the operatives that the allegations the squatters made stating that they did not receive a letter from the CHNPA is false since they were all given notice. They were given ample time even before this exercise start, started. They had a big notice boards on the A, B and C and thing, D as well, stating well look, squatting is illegal, you should not squat under the arm or continue to squat, plus 
recently and even on the television stations it is stated that look they will eventually remove the squatters very soon and lately they had notices served to them an agreement was made between Chief Executive Officer Lilon Saul and the representative of the squatters, Clement Jarvis. The agreement says that those who were granted the land before the demolition initiative will be removed and also those who do not have lands, the agency will place them in the system to receive land. We will work with Mr. Jarvis to bring some party in that area. Uh, Mr. Jarvis has given the commitment that they will not allow no squatters to move on to the area. Um, on our part, CHNP will process the application of those persons and also we will work with um, the group to bring some order to that area. Reporting for MTV's News Updates, I am Yanis Abrams. In another tragic event, a horrific smash-up on the quarantine public road has left five persons, including two children, dead. Initial investigation revealed that the passenger car was proceeding at a very fast rate, resulting in a deadly accident. Nikhil Jandu with the details. Dead are Dan Paul Krishna Dayal, Sabita Manglani, Emmanuel Manglani, Ethan Ramjeet, and Reshma C. Ram. The accident occurred on the number 19 public road, Quarantine Barbies. Police investigation revealed that the motor car PPP 3394, driven by Kishan Dayal, was proceeding at a very fast rate along the public road heading towards Skeldon when it collided with motor lorry GZ2764 that was proceeding in the opposite direction. The lorry was driven by Dudram Singh of number 49 village quarantine Barbies. As a result of the impact, the driver of the car and the four occupants sustained severe injuries and were pronounced dead on arrival at the Skelton Public Hospital. The police say the five bodies are presently at the hospital's mortuary awaiting a post-mortem examination. The driver of the lorry sustained injuries and is hospitalized in a critical condition. Nikhil Jondo reporting for MTV News Update. On a brighter note, the Ghana Defence Force is looking to intensify its presence in the hinterland to be able to have a wider surveillance of the large remote areas. This follows the discovery of an illegal aircraft and airstrip in the Rupununi. Find out more in this report. Chief of Staff of the Ghana Defence Force, Brigadier Patrick West, during an exclusive interview said, the force is working to improve surveillance in the hinterland. He noted that, the force is not armed with the relevant equipment to monitor all activities in that part of the country. But most importantly, we need the human intelligence, the cooperation of the various committees, uh, council members to report issues so that we can have um, uh, correct information that we can follow on. Only recently, an illegal aircraft was discovered in the Rupununi on an illegal airstrip which was newly constructed. The contractor and a businessman in Lethem were arrested and placed before the court. Initial investigation had revealed that the plane belonged to a Brazilian company. The chief of staff noted that the plane is still being held as the Ghana Revenue Authority has outstanding work to complete. Burgundy West added that the plane is secured in the hangars of the Ghana Defense Force as the investigation continues. Ghana Revenue Authority 
has the uh, requisite actions to take prior to any other action being taken by the defense force. Uh, in that regard, the police also has some actions to take and uh, we're waiting on those actions to be concluded and then we'll make a statement on the aircraft. Nikia John, the reporting for MTV News Update. In another shocking story, we tell you that 11 persons have been rushed to the Georgetown Public Hospital following a vehicular accident on the Monrepo Public Road on Tuesday, October 17. The accident caused the Route 44 minibus loaded with passengers to flip approximately four times. The Hill John Lu filed with this report. A woman is grateful for her life after a minibus missed her by a couple of inches. According to the eyewitness, she was standing at the corner of the road waiting on a bus when a minibus slammed into a motor car. The woman related that the driver of the motor car was proceeding south into the street where Melcher Furniture Store is located. Put on the traffic gate of a turn and the bus was overtaken. So when the bus was overtaken, he lashed to him and spin him wrong. So he ended up at the bottom here and like he lose control and start turn over. He turned over four times and end up middle of the road and then afterward the people um, and they start hauling the people um, come out and start for help or push the bus and turn it over get out the, start pull out the passenger them well like 21 school children and he had some big people inside but I, mean, I know how much big people like about four or five of them big people or so went in the bus yes he was speeding all the direction coming from like overtaking because when he just started he just swing he knock him and he spin the car around the driver of the motor car, Alim Shaw, said he put on his indicator to turn into the street. The young man recalled that when he looked into his mirror, another vehicle was trying to overtake. So as I, yeah, I was coming to turn through the car now. So as I turn now, the bus overtake. When the bus overtake, I already went turning. He come and hit me on the right, the right hand side of the front of the vehicle. That's when he tried to pull inside. So as he tried to pull inside, this is when he toppled here. They go the stand on the road. He toppled three times and end up there. Yes, yeah, right side indicator. They split on into Melch Road, the same road here. The driver and the conductor of the minibus was immediately arrested and placed in custody. The minibus was heading up the east coast of the Marara. Eleven passengers were rushed to the Georgian Public Hospital for medical attention. <laughs> According to a rank at the hospital, the 11 passengers sustained cuts and bruises about their bodies. It was said by a bystander that the minibus was overloaded. However, the police ranks at the scene could not provide such details. The driver of the motor car is also assisting with the investigation. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. A delay of the holding of local government election is possible since there is no chairman of the Ghana Election Commission. This is according to the Minister of Communities, Ronald Bulkan. According to the Minister of Communities, local government election schedule for 2018 can be delayed since a chairman for the Ghana Elections Commission is yet to be appointed by the president. I believe as we speak that cabinet today may even in my absence, um, be discussing this issue. Balkan said discussions are ongoing for the local government commission between cabinet members. We have not had any um, official word from GCOM or from the CEO, and uh, therefore it is our expectation that the, that timetable um, could and will be met. The local government commission will oversee, monitor, investigate, and examine the actions of the councils. Minister Balkan said after the local government elections in 2018, a new town council will be established in Madia along with three neighborhood democratic councils at Barakara, Kurukuru, and Aranaputa. Local government election was last held in 2016 under the coalition government. Prior to this, under the People's Progressive Party government, it was not held in over two decades. Reporting for MTV's News Update, I am Yanis Abrams. 
Some of the burden of the bags of rice farmers has been lifted as there has been a surprising increase in paddy prices for the second crop of 2017. The Guyana Rice Development Board revealed that there has been an upward trend in paddy prices at the commencement of their recent harvesting season. Find out more in this Lashana Gomes Cornelius report. What is responsible for this steady increase in paddy prices, according to the Guyana Rice Development Board, GRDB, are the recent rice paddy exports to markets in Mexico and Cuba, with Panama already on the list of other countries to have contracts with the government to receive paddy. Currently, the average price for paddy is between $2,089 to $3,300 per bag. Additionally, while Region 3 is normally paid the lowest prices for rice paddy, for the second crop it has recorded a significant increase. Regions 4 and 5, respectively, are also being receiving high prices per metric ton of rice paddy in the country. Despite these positive figures, GRDB is mindful of the report that a few millers are not paying according to the grade of paddy which they milled. GRDB claims that these millers are paying one price for all the grades of rice paddy. In this regard, the Guyana Rice Development Board is urging millers, despite a significant rise in the prices for rice paddy, all payments and certification of paddy must and should be made in accordance to the confines of the Rice Factories Act. Since the Venezuelan Petrocarb deal came to an end, rice farmers have been paid a minuscule amount for their produce. In 2015 and 2016, rice farmers claim to have been receiving as low as $1,300 per bag of paddy, while the cost of production remained the same. This has forced the farmers to give up on acres of rice fields. Reporting for MTV News Update, Lushona Gomes, Cornelius. Dominica's Minister of Housing, Land and Water Resource Management, Reginald Ostry, says the country is in the mopping up stage following Hurricane Maria on September 18. Find out more in this report. The Minister of Housing, Lands and Water Resources Management, Reginald Ostry, noted that currently, Dominicans are still reeling from the devastation which gripped the island following Hurricane Maria. The government official noted that regional and international agencies have been able to assist in the rebuilding of the Hurricane Torn Island. However, in the face of rebuilding, the Dominican official is also reporting that the island is under a flood threat, heightening the possibility of flooding and compromising the availability of portable water for the islanders. And we're in the process of spending some $35 million trying to get our water systems back in place. We have already spent about $25 million doing that, and all of this is zero. We're back to square one from whence we came. The Dominican official said he is looking forward to have Guyanese experts in the various fields to assist in rebuilding the infrastructure. We've lost pipes. 12-inch pipes, 10-inch pipes, 8-inch pipes, 4-inch pipes, 2-inch pipes. The Chekhov storage tank just recently con uh, constructed. It's flat down. It has to be rebuilt. Access roads. And really, had it not been for resilience, we'd probably still be on our knees. The minister said, it is a lesson for the Caribbean and the wider world that climate change is happening. He claimed that many countries are beginning to place the topic of climate change on the back burner. But here we are paying the price of uh, on countries that pay no regard or no attention to the protection of the environment. And I'm really hoping that our partners here with us would assist us in getting a message across to those countries that climate change may not be an issue for them, but is in fact an issue for us here in the region, small island developing states. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. Playing with firecrackers inside your home is not such a good idea. A Diamond House and Scheme family found that out the hard way when their home was torched as a result of horseplay. Nikhil John, filed this report. That is what remains of the one-story house at Diamond Housing Scheme East Bank, the Marara. Fire Chief Marlon Gentle said 
the mother of the three children, was not at home when the fire started. Gentle explained that the woman left to purchase some items at a nearby shop when the unfortunate event took place. The fire chief added that the mother purchased the firecrackers and hid them from the children. However, the children found the hidden firecrackers and began to play with them inside the house. He noted that may have caused the fire to start, which completely torched the house. The fire also affected the two neighboring houses. Nothing was saved from the inferno. In the meantime, the Ghana Fire Service has launched a probe into the matter. Nikhil Jondo reporting for MTV News Update. The Minister of State Joseph Harmon announces that the minimum wages is set to be lifted to $60,000. He also says that the 2017 salary increases will cost the government $3.5 billion. Here's more from Yanis Abrams. Minister of State Joseph Harmon during the post-cabinet briefing stated that a final offer has been given to the Guyana Public Service Union for wages and salary increases. For salaries ranging from 0 to 55,555, 55, the new minimum wage would be $60,000. So it's a movement from 55,555 to 60,000. For persons who are within a salary range of $55,556 to $99,999, an 8% increase. For persons in the range of 100000 to $299,999, an increase of 6%. From 300000 to 499999 an increase of 5%. From 500000 to 699000 $999, an increase of 4%. From $700,000 to $799,999, an increase of 2%. And from $800,000 to $1 million, an increase of 0.5%. According to Permanent Secretary of the Department of Public Service, Reginald Brotherson, the union has said that 2016 salaries are incomplete. The PS stated that the increases will cost the government $3.5 billion. Because of the letter to them dated the 5th of December 2016 indicated that wages, salaries and allowances are incomplete. In our clarification with His Excellency, he clearly was referring to allowances. But for the government side, a final offer was given in 2016. So the union has decided that they're going to write his excellency um, for that level of clarification. But the government negotiated team was very clear that we had concluded 2016 negotiations insofar as wages and salaries were concerned. So of course the union um, you know, put this offer on the table and that is the government's final offer in respect of 2017 for wages and salaries. In addition to the public service workers, Minister Harmon stated that talks for salary increases for teachers and military personnel are separate discussions, but several issues need to be dealt with under the multi-year agreement for teachers. He further mentioned there are possibilities for another multi-year agreement in the pipeline. Um, so I, I think it is basically a good approach to take to salaries and wages um, where you can have these multi agreements that you don't have to come back every year. And so that those negotiations, of course, take a little longer than, than the regular year-to-year -year negotiations. Um, so I want to say to the teachers' union and to the teachers that certainly there's no sidelining. The Minister of State also mentioned that the Minister of Finance, Winston Jordan, and the President will make a pronouncement if bonuses will be given to workers. Reporting for MTV's News Update, I am Yanis Abrams. A Lance Corporal of the Ghana Defence Force lost his life two days before participating in the activities to officially declare Lethem a town. The soldier was walking in the corner of the road in Lethem when an intoxicated man riding a motorcycle canoed into him. Nikhil Jondu has more. 
Divisional Commander for Interior Locations, Ravindra Dad Budram, said the driver is still receiving medical attention. The driver slammed into Lance Corporal Devon Fraser, who was walking along the road. The divisional commander noted that the prime suspect is on the police guard at the Lethem Hospital. The police say Fraser and another individual was walking on the eastern side of the road when the motorcyclist hit him from behind. As a result of the impact, the cyclist Elroy Francis and Lance Corporal Fraser were rushed to the Lethem Hospital where Fraser was pronounced dead on arrival. The police added that Francis, the motorcyclist of Central Lethem, was tested and found to be above the legal limit of alcohol consumption. Commander Budaram said the post-mortem examination on the body of the Guyana Defense Force Lance Corporal will be conducted on Friday. He added that when the suspect is discharged from the hospital, charges will be laid against him. The Guyana Defense Force in a statement noted that Lance Corporal Fraser was in Latham to provide musical accompaniment for the activities in observance of Latham becoming a township. The statement added that the force is saddened by the news of his passing. Lance Corporal Fraser is survived by his wife, who is expecting their second child, an 18-month-old son, his mother and siblings. Nikhil John, the reporting for MTV News Update. That's a wrap for MTV News Update's Week in Review. The newscast can be viewed online on MTV's Facebook page and also on our YouTube channel. Join us Monday, October 23 at 7 hours 30 for another edition of MTV News Update. On behalf of our news team, I'm Ashley Scotland, thanking you for watching.